All right, so this is lecture 29 or the 29th day. We are now shifting to our third and final major topic, generating functions. So we're going to use a lot of the stuff we've done in probability. The goal is to come up with a proof of the central limit theorem. Did we do generating functions for the Fibonacci numbers in Binet's formula? Did we do that in this class? Okay, we did do it. Okay, I thought we had done that, and we used partial fractions to expand, and we got the closed form expression. Wonderful. All right. One of the dangers is always using advanced mathematics and not really understanding what you're using because it's from a class you haven't taken. We really need complex analysis, and for complex analysis, we really need real analysis. We don't have time to, all, to do all that. I want to give you a sense of how dangerous the subject is, and leave it at that. And if people want more details, I can post some videos online from previous years. I'm happy to meet with people and discuss what is needed. But I want to give you a sense of why things are hard. Let's go back to one dimension. How many ways are there to approach a point in one dimension? OK, I'm seeing a lot of people going two. So in one dimension, I really have two ways to approach a point. I walk forward, I walk backwards. When I teach multivariable calculus, and I know there's at least a couple of people here, they may remember that I got uh, my daughter's preschool class to do a huge number of scribbles. And I think everybody got their own individual scribble. Is that correct? Some were photocopies. Some, oh, right, yeah, some of them were photocopies because the originals were just too valuable and the kids wouldn't give them up, but yes. So imagine in the complex plane, I do something like this. You know, some kind of strange path. This is still a path approaching a point. The problem is there are far more ways to approach a point in the complex plane than in the real line. And if you say a, a function is complex differentiable, it's got to be complex differentiable. The limit has to exist no matter what path you take. And that is a much stronger statement than in real line. So let's go back to the strangest function in real analysis. What's the really bad function? Anybody remember? Its Taylor series was shocking. Don't hit students in class. What function? You yeah, it was e to the negative 1 over x squared if x does not equal 0, and 0 if x equals 0. There are some math majors who graduate without ever seeing the square root of negative 1 in complex numbers. This does not happen in my classes. Let's let i be the square root of negative 1. z, a complex number, means we can write z as x plus i, y. x and y are real numbers. Let's extend this function to be a function of a complex variable. So it'll be e to the negative 1 over z squared z does not equal 0, 0 if z equals 0. This doesn't seem like that big of a deal. I've just changed x's to z's. Let's calculate the limit as z approaches 0. There are two very good ways to approach 0, along the x-axis and, yes, along the y-axis, right? The two most natural things. So if we take those two limits. Let's take the limit as x goes to 0 of f of x that's just equal to 0. We could also take the limit as y goes to 0 of f of i, y. So what we're doing here is we're coming either down or up the y-axis. Well, this would then be the limit as y goes to 0 of e to the negative 1 over i y squared. Well, what's i squared? Negative 1. So this is the same as the limit as y goes to 0 of e to the 1 over y squared. Well, as y gets smaller and smaller and smaller, 1 over y squared gets larger, 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 always positive. What does this limit equal? What's it going to Yes? It equals infinity. So this shows that this function 
which was really nice. I mean, it was infinitely differentiable. It had extremely rapid decay at the origin. But when you look at it as a complex analytic function, or as a complex valued function, it actually isn't even continuous at the origin. Complex analysis is a strange subject. It's going to be taught this spring. It is hopefully going to be taught again next year. If a function is complex differentiable once, it turns out it's infinitely differentiable, and it equals its Taylor series expansion. It's incredible what happens with complex analytic functions. As soon as you know the function is complex analytic, you know a lot. The way you should think about this is, remember how you forgot from Calc 3 Stokes' theorem and Green's theorem? Remember forgetting those? And you remembered that, oh, if my curl is zero, I can convert this integral to a line integral, and it's really easy because it's going to be zero. And I love things whose curl are zero. These complex differentiable functions are, in a sense, the analog of curl is zero. And it allows you to reduce integration to algebra. All you have to do is find like the negative first coefficient in a Taylor series expansion, and you can calculate a lot of integrals of complex valued functions. And it can give you a lot of integrals of real valued functions. So one of the best ways to evaluate these things is through real analysis. Uh, put it in alphabetical order, but don't block the camera. So what we're going to do is we're going to just leave this as a warning that complex analysis is a very strange subject. It is different than real analysis, but that's what's lurking in the background to make a lot of our stuff work. And that if a function is not complex differentiable, very strange things can happen, even if the real part is nice. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to shift and talk a little bit about generating functions. Okay. So we've already seen generating functions before. This is one of the reasons why we did Fibonacci numbers early in the semester, is we built up some material. So generating functions. And hopefully you remember how nice it was that we could use generating functions to get Binet's formula. We start off with this recurrence relation for the Fibonacci's. We build a function. We then get an explicit closed form expression for that function. We solve it. We use partial fractions and expand, and out pops Binet's formula. And the idea is that if we piece together local information into a global object, we can then deduce things about the object we care about. So this is like a local to global principle. And that's what we're going to be doing throughout the rest of the semester. We're going to be taking small bits of local information, putting them together, and trying to get an object that we can deduce things from. This is a fundamentally new idea. Okay. So let's say we have a sequence an. I do not want to do generating functions in the greatest possible generality. I will assume my sequence is integer, is just defined at say the uh, non-negative integers. So I will assume it's you know a0, a1, a2, a3, a4. When we get to random variables, when I do discrete random variables, they will be taking on values at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. For a lot of what we're studying, this is fine. You know, we want to record how many accidents were there at the intersection. There are not going to be pi accidents at the intersection. We want to record how many runs did the Red Sox allow. They're not going to allow E runs. A lot of the things we care about are integer valued. Or if they're not integer valued, just put in enough decimals and then multiply by a corresponding power of 100. And for all practical purposes, you can approximate something that's continuous with something that's discrete. Uh, anybody ever look at the stock market? How much are stock prices in terms of? A share. A share. But when you cost the share, how much is the share? It varies by company. But I'm saying, what kind of decimals do they give you? Is it every 10, every 100, every 1,000, every 10,000? Or do they stop at some finite point? They stop at cents. Or sometimes they might do like one eighth. But you know, there's only finitely many possibilities for the decimal part. If you look at prices of gas, you know, price of gas is in nine tenths of a cent. I've never seen anything for the last digit other than nine tenths. Well, that's fine. We can just multiply by a thousand and just push it over. So for a lot of things, even if it's continuous, we can approximate it well enough with the discrete. When you look at a huge company, you know, if you're looking at their revenue, a few cents here or there is not going to matter. So over here, we have some sequence an. We're going to form a new function, g a of s, and I hate that we use the letter s, is going to be a sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of a n s to the n. You always want to think about notation. 
Why do you think we have the letter G? Generating. Generating. Why do you think we have a subscript A? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's the sequence AN. If the sequence was called BN, I would probably have G sub B. I want labels that are good so I can quickly glance down and see what's going on. This is referring to the sequence, okay? And we've already seen generating functions for the Fibonacci numbers. And so then the question becomes, what can we say about these generating functions? So whenever you get a sequence, what's the first question you should ask a sequence? Or a series, yes. Does it converge? So let's do a couple of examples. Somebody give me an example for an. I'm sorry? Okay, so 1 is 1 over n. I think there's an easier one than 1 over n. 1, right? Simplest example. Let's say an is always 1. Then that implies that our, sequ that our generating function is the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of 1 times s sub n, which is 1 over 1 minus s if the absolute value of s is less than 1. So the generating function will converge if the absolute value of s is less than 1. It will diverge if the absolute value of s is greater than 1. So this is wonderful. This simple example tells us that for generating functions, they may sometimes converge and they may sometimes diverge. All right, the next one was a n equals 1 over n. This gives the generating function of s is the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of 1 over n s sub n. And the question is, is there a nice closed form expression for this? Yes. Ah, uh, we would have a problem with n equals 0. Yes, yeah, so you're right. So for this one, we should actually start it at 1. Thank you. I think we might be able to get a closed form expression for this one. This one's going to be a little bit hard. But if we apply the operator s d by ds, the ends will cancel, and we'll have a geometric series, which we know. So this derivative of this is going to be like a geometric series. Maybe I can integrate it upwards. So I actually think I could probably get a closed form expression for this if I wanted to, you know, just using that kind of operator. Uh, another good example, you know, again, I'm trying to find something that I can understand what the limit is. There's another good choice for an. Okay, so I could do n, and then this would give us, you know, ga of s is the sum, and it goes from 1 to infinity of n, s to the n. And now we have to remember some results from either real analysis or calc 3, which is always dangerous. This will converge if the absolute value of s is less than 1. Best way to see this is ratio test. Because if you do the ratio test, n over n plus 1 goes to 1, and you'll get an s coming out. All right. A little bit stronger would be a n equals n factorial. Then you would get g a of s is the sum, and goes from 1 to infinity of n factorial times s to the n. And this will diverge if the absolute value of s does not equal 0. I'm not sure why I didn't just write s equals 0. One way to see this is n factorial is at least n over e to the n. So no matter how small s is, eventually the n over e is going to dwarf this. So eventually n factorial times s is going to, to the n will be at least uh, some number greater than 1 to the nth power. It's going to blow up. So I urge you to you know, go through this calculation slowly, uh, use the ratio test, use the root test. But this will converge essentially for no values of s other than s equals 0. Is it impressive to converge for s equals 0? Is this worth writing home about? No. By definition, it's just a zero. It's a finite sum. So I'm really not that impressed that it converges. The last one is a n equals 1 over n factorial. And you would get g a of s would just be e to the s when the algebra settles. Because it's just you know, s to the n over n factorial. 
So here's an example where it converges for all values of s. Here's an example where it converges for no values. Here's an example where it converges for some values. We have places where we have explicit formulas. We have places where, with some work, we can get explicit formulas. Uh, this one, we could actually get explicit formulas using differentiating identities. As a rule of thumb, we prefer situations where we have explicit closed form expressions. We can do a lot more with those. Okay? So the real question now becomes, this is a probability class. We need to choose ANs. They should be related to our probability distribution. Right? Has everybody copied down all the examples? All right. So let's try to think about what we want the ANs to be. I want you to try to save as much Blackboard space to keep all of this uh, visible. So for now, x is a discrete random variable on the non-negative integers. We need to figure out a sequence a n to associate to x. Any thoughts? I'm sorry? Well, no, no, no. I'm saying, I'm not telling you what x is. I'm just saying it's a random variable that takes on non-negative integer values. So it's, it's non-zero at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Maybe it's geometric. Maybe it's negative binomial. Maybe it's binomial. Maybe it's Bernoulli. Maybe it's Poisson. And you need to somehow associate a sequence a n to it. What would be a choice? So that's a very natural thing. It's the probability x equals n. Another possibility would be the expected value of x to the n. You know, this one is not as immediate as a good idea. But if you think back to Taylor series, the idea of the Taylor series is if you could only know one thing about a function, you would want to know, well, what's its value at this point? If you could know two things about the function, you would want to know what's its value at the point and how fast is it changing. If you could know three things, you would then add the acceleration. And the idea is the more you know, the deeper Taylor series you can take and the better job you can do approximating the function, at least locally. Maybe something like that would be good here. And maybe it would be good to choose our ANs to be related to the moments. There is a function that's similar to the generating function that involves moments. Can you guess what its name is? Yes. The moment generating function. You know, unlike the people who gave us cosecant, these people actually used good nomenclature. All right. What do you think the moment generating function generates? The moments. Okay. So we will get back to this later. It is natural to consider something like this. And the hope is that the more we know about the moments, because the moments take into account the whole distribution. These probabilities take into account only what's going on locally at one point. But the idea is both of these should give us paths to understand the function. So let's consider this one. So we'll consider this for now. We'll ignore that for now. And we'll let g a, well, I'll call it gx of s will be the sum, and it goes from 0 to infinity, and then I have the probability that x equals n times s to the n. Does that look like anything to anybody? Anybody recognize this? Nobody saw this on Spring Street over the weekend or Route 2. There's really not many places to check on this campus. All right, let me rewrite it in hopefully a more illuminating way. If I write it like this, does this look like anything you've seen? Yes? Does it look like a moment? Yeah. 
So why is it so much easier when I put it like this that it looks like a moment and over here it doesn't? I've just switched the order of multiplication. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, the, the fact that you got brave enough is still at least supporting my claim that this is a friendlier way of writing the algebra. That when you see the professor writing it like this, okay, I know. And I was exactly like that in college. There were so many times, you know, I knew what the answer was but did not want to risk saying it out loud, especially because one of the professors would often explode on wrong answers. But it's another story. So what expectation does it look like? It looks like the expected value of what? Yes. S to the X. Now this is not quite how we normally like to write things, but it's not horrible. There will be differences between discrete random variables and continuous random variables. But the nice thing is this generating function is built up on the local probabilities and we can interpret it as a nice expected value. What do you think would be the case if we have two random variables, x and y, they're both, you know, for all of today, they're going to be non-negative integers. So x and y non-negative integer, and let's say gx plus u of s equals gy of s for all s less than some delta. And we'll say delta is greater than zero, so it provides information. What do you think must be true? Yeah, that this should imply, then we get theorem, x and y have the same density. Now, if x and y have the same density, do they have the same generating functions? Yes, because then they have the same probabilities. This direction is kind of trivial. Right? It's this direction that's non-trivial. That if they have the same generating functions, they must be the same. And this is beginning to give us a sense of how we're going to get to the central limit theorem. What we're going to do is we're going to show that in the limit, the generating function of the average is converging to the generating function of the standard normal. And then we need these black box results from complex analysis that say if the generating function is converging to the generating function of this random variable, then the densities are converging. That is not always the case. And that's where we really need some results from complex analysis. But roughly, this is where we're going. This is the quick guidepost to what we're going to be seeing. We want to calculate generating functions. We want to show generating functions are converging. And then since they're converging, that implies the densities are coming along for the ride. All right? The proof is not too bad. What would you love to do? So we have gx of s is the sum and goes from 0 to infinity of s to the n, the probability x equals n, and we have gy of s is the sum and goes from 0 to infinity of s to the n, probability y equals n. So I know these are equal. And I now want to show that term by term they're equal. How could I show that they're equal term by term? I'm sorry? So I can try writing out the terms, but I've got infinitely many terms on one side and infinitely many terms on the other side. Are there any points which might be easy to evaluate the function? Yes. N equals zero? N equals zero? Oh, sorry, that, doesn't make sense. that doesn't make sense. So you have to tell me a value of s. What would be a good value of s to take? Yes. So if I take s equals one, 
then the sum over here is just one because it's the sum of all the probabilities, and the sum over here is just one because it's all the probabilities. So S equals one is nice in that all these terms are equal, the S to the Ns, but it doesn't lead to a calculation that's helpful. What's a good choice of S? There's only one candidate. Yes? Uh, one over E. Uh, one over E, you would need to know things about the probabilities, and one over E is not a good candidate. What kind of symmetry do we have in this function? We have absolute value of S is less than delta. What would be a good value of S to take? So but, uh, it, it's strictly less than delta, so we don't know what's going on at delta. And that's just you know some region where we know it exists. I'm sorry? OK. But how would that help you? You would have these callably weighted things. We want to have just one term. We want one term up, up top and one term down below. What value can we take for s so there will only be one term? Zero. What would you get if you just take s equals zero? Right? So if we, so if we just take s equals zero, we would just get the probability x equals zero and the probability y equals zero. So you take s equals zero. Now what we do is we subtract the s equals zero term from both sides, and we now know that the sum n goes from one to infinity of s to the n probability x equals n is equal to the sum n goes from one to infinity s to the n probability y equals n. Yes? But it, do, it doesn't, but we're, gonna, we're defining 0 to the 0 to be 1. So the only term that survives is the probability x equals 0 and the probability y equals 0. So those two must be the same. And now, since those two are the same, we can remove them, and now we have the sum from 1 to infinity. What divides both sides? Something divides both sides. Something divides every term on the left-hand side. S. And so we can divide by S. So this is the same as the sum, n goes from 1 to infinity of S to the n minus 1. Probability x equals n is the sum, n goes from 1 to infinity, S to the n minus 1. Probability y equals n. And now what, what should we take S to be? Now we take s to be 0 again. And then if you take s equals 0 here, this gives us the probability x equals 0 is the probability y equals 0. Now we take s equals 0, and this gives us the probability x equals 1 equals the probability y equals 1. And we just march down, march down, march down, march down. What we would have loved to have done is to say the only way these series can be the same is if every term is the same. That you can't have two Taylor series with different uh, coefficients. You can't have two different infinite sums with different coefficients being equal in a neighborhood. We don't quite have that result from analysis, so the way we can get around this is we can just do it term by term by term by term. Technically, we should be doing an induction. And then we just march all the way down. Okay? So what we would now have is that if the two generating functions are equal in a small neighborhood that contains the origin, then the two densities must be the same. It is not the case if it's continuous, sadly. And that's one of the reasons why discrete mean variables are going to be a little bit easier. But this is a, a potentially a way to identify a discrete mean variable. If we can calculate its generating function, the generating function is unique. And so if we calculate the generating function of some of the standard distributions, if we then have a new distribution and we calculate its generating function and we can match it, then we now know what it is. Okay, so any questions on this one? 
So what I want to do now is I now want to do a specific example. So I want to keep this on the board. I'll erase this part. So one of my favorite discrete random variables, and yes, I do have a list, is the Poisson. Right. We saw the Poisson was extremely useful in proving Stirling's formula. So let's look at the Poisson. So x is going to be Poisson with parameter lambda. This means the probability x equals n is equal to lambda to the n e to the minus lambda over n factorial if n greater than or equal to 0 is an integer, 0 otherwise. So let's calculate the generating function. What would be the generating function? So this would be the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity of, and this is why I've been very careful not to erase this, s to the n times the probability x equals n. So we would have s to the n, lambda to the n, e to the minus lambda over n factorial. Okay? What should I pull out of the sum? Yes. So pull out e to the minus lambda, and I have a sum n goes from 0 to infinity. How should I write the numerator? Yes. S times lambda to the n. S times lambda to the n. Ah, what does that look like? e to the s lambda. So we get e to the negative lambda, e to the s lambda. I'm going to rewrite this because it's so important. And actually, since we're not going to need it for a while, I'll rewrite it all the way down here. Uh, hmm. Maybe I won't. OK. So we get that if x is Poisson with parameter lambda, then the generating function of x at s is just going to be e, there's a couple of ways of writing it, of s minus 1 times lambda. That's its generating function. So if I have a discrete random variable whose generating function equals that, the only possibility is it's a Poisson. OK? All right. Any questions so far? All right. What we're now going to do is we're now going to see why generating functions walk. How many of you have taken linear algebra? How many of you have not taken linear algebra? OK. We actually just discovered that technically linear algebra is not a prerequisite for this class. It's strongly encouraged, but there is a way through doing like math 200 and a bunch of other things. Oh, I wanted not to erase. Oh, well. Um, so how many of you know how to multiply matrices? Everyone's hand should be up right now. Why do we define matrix multiplication the way we do? Matrix multiplication is you have a transformation, and the matrix is the representation of the transformation in a given basis. And what you wonder is matrix multiplication is defined so that if you have your B followed by A, that's the same as this new matrix that corresponds to the composition of these transformations. And that's one of the reasons why we have the rules we do for matrix multiplication, is we want the matrix corresponding to this uh, convolution to be the product of these matrices. And that makes things really nice. We've talked about convolutions for random variables. You know, if we are adding two random variables, the convolution gives us the density. It could be an integral if it's continuous. It could be a sum if it's discrete. So what I want to do now is I want to imagine that I'm going to multiply a couple of series and not really worry about whether or not things converge and just try to think of what might be worth studying. So let's say we have you know, sequences An and Bn. So we can have you know, Ga of s times Gb of s will equal gc of s. And we're going to say c is a star b, the convolution. 
So what we're basically saying is if I give you GA and GB, if they converge in some neighborhood, I should be able to get a new function which will have its own sequence when I just expand things. So let's see what we would get. We would have A0 plus A1S plus A2S squared plus dot 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 times B0 plus B1S plus B2S squared plus dot dot dot. And I want to multiply. So what I'm going to do is when I multiply, I'm going to collect all the terms that have the same power of S. So the constant term is really easy. It's just A0, B0. Now for the S term, I could have A0 times B1, or I could have A1 times B0. So I'm going to have A0, B1 plus A1, B0 times S. For the S squared term, I could have A0 times B2. I could have A1 times B1, or I could have A2 times B0. So we'll have a0, b2, plus a1, b1, plus a2, b0, s squared, plus dot, dot, dot. And hopefully it's clear what's going on. That if you look at each coefficient, if I want the second one, the two indices sum to two. And I just go through all the combinations. So I'll have three terms. If I want the kth, I'll have k plus one terms. So I'll get more generally, you know, Cn will be the sum, k goes from 0 to n, of a, k, b, and minus k. And again, I'm just defining something right now. The question is always, when is this a good definition? What's nice about this is, if I just multiply the series formally, this is what I would get. So if everything converges, this is what the answer should be. Doesn't this look a lot like a convolution? If we go back to the interpretation, let's say x is such that, you know, a k is the probability x equals k, and y is such that b n minus k is the probability that y equals n minus k, then what we're getting is c n is going to be the sum k goes from 0 to n of the probability x equals k, probability y equals n minus k. What is this sum going to equal? What's the fast way of saying what the sum equals? Yes? X plus y. Almost. x plus y equals... This is the probability that x plus y equals what number? N. n. This is just the probability that x plus y equals n. So if x and y are independent, and you will always be looking at independent random variables, we have the following wonderful fact. x, y, independent, discrete, non-negative integer, then g of x of s times g y of s is equal to g what? What's the subscript? We just got it from here. What would be the subscript? x plus y. So this is really nice. The product of the generating functions is the generating function of the sum. And if x and y have the same density, then this sum is just going to be the power of that. And you can begin to see maybe how the central limit theorem will come into place. Okay. So this is a major result. This is telling us that generating functions behave very nicely with respect to convolutions. So generating functions behave well with respect to convolutions. Okay. We've got 10 minutes left. That should be more than enough time to do the algebra.
Do we all agree that if x and y are independent, discrete, the generating function of the product is the generating function of the sum? And so the product of the generating functions is the generating function of the sum. Okay. What was the random variable I really liked? Poisson. And remember, we placed the Poisson random variables generating function off on the side of the board. And we proved earlier today that if we have discrete random variables, you know, taking on non-negative integer values, the generating function is unique. The Poisson is a very nice type of distribution. Other nice examples are the Cauchy and the Gaussian. What do all these distributions have in common? What word? Yes. They're stable. Poisson plus Poisson is Poisson. We proved that by doing some algebra, right? And by cleverly noticing and multiplying by one and whatnot. Here's another way. So theorem, Poisson plus Poisson equals Poisson. So let's say x is Poisson with parameter lambda 1. Well, let's do xi is Poisson with parameter lambda i. So instead of doing x and y, I'll do x1 and x2. This saves some chalk. And I'm running out of time. So let's calculate the generating function of x1 plus x2 of s. This is the generating function of x1 at s times the generating function of x2 at s. Well, we know what the generating function of a Poisson is. It's just e to the s, I'm um, doing s minus 1 times lambda, 1, and then e to the s minus 1 lambda 2. Right? What do I do now? I add the exponents. And so when I add the exponents, they both have an s minus 1. And I get lambda 1 plus lambda 2. But we know the generating function is unique for discrete random variables that take on values that are non-negative integers. Which random variable has this as its density? I'm sorry, as its generating function? Yeah. And so this implies x1 plus x2 has to be Poisson with parameter lambda 1 plus lambda 2. So you can compare this proof to what we did before. I think this proof is much faster. And you can see the benefit of isolating these results about generating functions. You, because we know we have some kind of uniqueness here for discrete random variables, if we can identify the generating function, we know what the, what the distribution must be. This is sadly not going to be the case. Uh, we are later going to look at moment generating functions. And with moment generating functions, it turns out you can have two random variables that have the same moment generating functions but are not equal. It's a catastrophe. It means we need a lot of deep results from real analysis and complex analysis to deal with those special cases. If we're in situations like this, we're fine. We don't have to worry about that. But whenever things are continuous, whenever they're infinities, you always have to be careful. Okay? All right, so this gives us Poisson. We now can calculate generating functions of lots of different things. It's always going to come down to when will we have a nice closed form expression. We are not always going to have a nice closed form expression. Okay. Any questions on what we've done up till now? Okay. Um, so what I will do is we've got about five minutes left. So I'm going to stop the tape here.